Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Keswick Chapel. I am Pastor Robert Wallace, and sitting to my left is Pastor Bud Reedy. He is the lead pastor for the Charlottesville First Church of the Nazarene, and today is Saturday, July the 25th, and we are excited that you have chosen to join us as we continue to look at our eighth session on <laughs> the divine appointment, Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, we went through, and I'm gonna, I'm just going to recount the story for you. They've got five discernible hearts, <laughs> five that we have identified. And as I go through the story, you'll, you'll pick up on these. And this is what I want you to pick up on. Obedience, seeking, receptive, witnessing, and worshiping. All five of these characteristics of their hearts mm are displayed in this passage of scripture today. So we're going to go through this. I'm going to tell you the story, and then we're going to talk about applications of dis disciplines that we can utilize in our life to help us draw closer to God. Yeah. And actually, we hit on something, Pastor Bud, last week. I thought it was very poignant, and I hope that everybody will listen for it today. You talked about, well, I was talking about a mindset. Antonius had a mindset. To, to follow Christ at all costs. And what we discovered and you pointed out was that he ended up with a heart set that was receptive mm. to God. So all of these stories that we're going to tell you today, starting with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, they had a heart set. Yeah, they did. And um, they both had a heart that beat for God. Yes. One of them, it was more of, in Philip, it was more of a sanctifying grace. Oh, I love that. Whereas in the Ethiopian eunuch, it was more of God's prevenient grace. Yes. Uh, but it was all about grace. Amen. And a little bit later, we're going to be talking about disciplines. Yes. You know, disciplines are our way of cooperating with God's spirit. Yes. And so that's something that we can intentionally do yes. to actually change and shape our hearts. Right. So I'm, I'm excited to hear the story again and then to talk about another discipline together. Absolutely. So turn your Bibles or your Bible app to Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 40, and follow along with me. What we have here is we have Philip. He is uh, ministering in Samaria, and an angel of the Lord shows up and says, uh, I need you to go to Gaza. And so the passage tells us that he gets up and he goes, and then the Luke switches to talking to us about the Ethiopian eunuch. The Ethiopian eunuch had been in Jerusalem, worshiping, celebrating, learning more about the, the God of the Jewish nation. And so he had a heart that was seeking to know who God was. And matter of fact, we talked about this. He was the, the Ethiopian eunuch was the uh, treasurer for the Candace. He was in charge of the entire treasury of Ethiopia. So he was a man of power, position, and importance, and yet he humbled himself to get to the fringes of the worship that was going on in Jerusalem, and then he was so, his desire was so strong to know who God was that he actually bought a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And so we see that he is traveling home, and he's reading the scroll of Isaiah. So then Philip, he's on his way. He gets to the desert road headed to Gaza, the, the less traveled road, if you will. And the Holy Spirit says, see that chariot? I want you to go catch that chariot. So he runs up and he catches the chariot. Now, he says, as he catches up, he hears this Ethiopian eunuch reading from the scroll of Isaiah. And he says, hey, man, do you know what you're reading? And the Ethiopian eunuch said, how can I unless somebody tells me? And with that, he invited Philip to get up into the chariot with him. So Philip climbs in. And so the eunuch is reading this passage in Isaiah 53 that's talking about Christ. And when he gets done, he looks at Philip and he is, I can only imagine, he's just very concerned. He says, who is the man talking about himself or someone else? And with that invitation, Philip takes this passage and he tells the Ethiopian eunuch, all about Jesus Christ, all the way up through his crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and the birth of the Christ, birth of Christ's church on the day of Pentecost. So 
they're riding along and all of a sudden the Ethiopian eunuch looks up and he sees a body of water. And he says, hey, there's water. What's to keep me from getting baptized? And with that, he stopped the chariot and he and Philip walked down to the water and Philip baptized him on the spot. And when they came up out of the water, Philip was taken away from his presence and the eunuch saw him no more. The eunuch went on his way home rejoicing, witnessing, and worshiping about what had taken place. His life had been radically changed in this one encounter. Philip found himself in Astos, and he went on his way witnessing and testifying and preaching in every town along the way until he came to Caesarea. That's the story, Pastor. Incredible story. This is the uh, the word of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks be unto God. Thanks be unto God. Amen. Quick prayer. Father, we love you. Not that we want to be quick or short, but Father, we want to get as much time in this morning that you will allow us to have, Father, to cover the things that you want us to cover. So we pray right now for everyone, including Pastor Bud and myself. Father, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Open our hearts and minds to be receptive to your word and to your truth today. May we all learn something this morning that will help us to grow in your grace. We love you. We pray that you will receive all glory and honor to yourself today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Pastor Bud, we talked about these, these types of hearts, and hopefully everyone has been able to see these types of hearts, Philip was obedient to do what God had called him to do, uh, even from uh, leaving Jerusalem to go to Samaria and then going on his road to on this road to Gaza all by himself. And yet at the same time, we see that he was seeking to do what God wanted him to do through his obedience. Right. And then that he had a receptive heart because the spirit, the whole, first of all, an angel tells him to go. Then the Holy Spirit tells him to go get closer and all this time we see him being receptive to what God is wanting him to do. And then because of that encounter, we see that he continues to witness and worship God. And he's, as you pointed out last week, what an amazing story he had to tell. It is. And I think as we're reading that story, we, we realize that, that we have been either Philip in that story before or we've been the Ethiopian eunuch in that story before. Yes. Um, but the one, the, the one thing that just keeps coming through is that a seeking heart, mm. um, a receptive heart can be developed. Yes. In other words, I think we all want to be more uh, of, of, of we, uh, you know, I want to be more of a seeker, yes. you know, and I want to be more receptive to the things of God. Mm. And so you think about it, the disciplines, all the disciplines we've talked about so far, mm-hmm make us more receptive. Absolutely I mean, right. it's, this isn't necessarily something that we do, but it's something that we do in cooperation with the Holy Spirit. Right. Who can help us be more receptive to the things of God. God is always speaking. Right. God is always working. God is always speaking. And oftentimes we miss God because we're not being as receptive to the things of God as we could be. And that's where disciplines come in because they make us more receptive. Absolutely. And, and, you know, so imagine the disciplines that both Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch had to get to this point. Yeah. You know what I mean? Sure. So, you know, uh, Philip had uh, disciplined himself to do and to listen, to do what God was calling him to do and to listen. And the Ethiopian eunuch had disciplined himself. Otherwise, how would he have ended up being the treasurer for an entire kingdom? Well, even, you know, even though he was pre-conversion, mm-hmm. the Ethiopian eunuch realized that reading the scripture yes. was a way of becoming more receptive yes. to the things of God. He was searching for truth. I don't know where he heard this from or whether it's just something that rose up within his own spirit. Right. But he went to great lengths to get a copy of the prophet Isaiah. Yep. Now, I guess you could say he was in the middle of Bible exploration yes. when he had this encounter with right. the Ethiopian, uh, you, oh, excuse me, with, with, Philip. with Philip. Right. And so yes. there you see one of the disciplines that we've already talked about. Right. In the life yes. of a person before mm. they became a Christian. So yeah. this this whole seeking for truth in the scripture 
was an expression of God's prevenient grace, the grace that goes before. Yeah. And he had a, he was receptive to the things of God. Right. And that's why he took the time to explore the scripture. That's awesome. And, you know, actually, I, I, I won't say who it is, but I, I know of someone who is a modern day testimony of that. Yeah. At one point in this person's life, they had got to the point where they said, look, I'm going to read your word every single day. I need you to show me what I need to know and what I need to learn. And that completely transformed this person's life because they availed themselves. They intentionally sought to explore God's word and to be receptive to what God had for them. Well, it, it probably goes without saying that we were on target when we talked about Bible exploration first. Absolutely. Um, in terms of, you know, developing a, a, a receptive heart or having right. a receptive spirit. Right. Um, and the discipline of exploring God's word, there is no substitute. I That's don't right. care where you are on your journey. Right. Whether you've, you're, you've not even made a decision right. to receive Christ yet or after you've made the decision to receive Christ and early on, right. whether you've been a Christian for 15 minutes or for 15 years or for 50 years. Right. There is no substitute for exploring the scripture as a way of God shaping your heart and you becoming more and more receptive. That's exactly right. And the other thing that we talked about was prayer. Sure. And uh, we talked about Jesus as the example for prayer for us. He, Jim, Jesus humbled himself and prayed, you know, on a regular yeah. basis. And that was another part that we talked about was the humility of both of these men. And we see that evidenced uh, in, in both of their lives and in the life of Christ. Then the other thing that we talked about was last week, we talked about the contemplative discipline. Yeah. Contemplating on God's word and what that means and how that works and how that can help us. And what was it that you said last week about uh, contemplative that... Um, just really struck a nerve. Mm. Trying to remember. It well, it had to do with the fact that contemplative and medit and meditation mm. are closely connected, but right. they're not the same thing. Right. Um, but to be contemplative means that you not only hear the word of God, you not mm. only read the scripture, but you intentionally spend time contemplating yes. what it means and how it applies to your own life. I remember that I put the direct quote down here and you may oh, have read it. Okay. It said focused attention on the soul of the soul towards God. So focused attention. Yeah. So when of we the soul towards God, yeah, we engage in contemplation, when we engage in contemplating God's word, a contemplative discipline. We are intentionally focusing our attention on. Hey, you know something, bro? I can soul. only see half your face. <laughs> and you've got such a good face. <laughs> like I want to see the whole thing, man. So it's I, good in there. There you yeah, go. I, I, That's I, better. I'm probably better in the frame, but thank you. I appreciate <laughs> that. Uh, so, yeah, so uh, contemplation, this is what you said. Contemplation is going deep yeah. in our walk with intentionality. That's what you said. I was yeah. Like, if we're not careful, if we're not careful, even our Bible exploration can become a mile wide and an inch deep. Yes. I mean, we, we just spend 15 minutes reading a chapter or two. Right. We don't take the time to reflect on it. We don't take the time to contemplate it. We don't time that, take the time to, to, to think about it and pray over it. Right. And for that reason, you know, we may be missing something God really wants to do in us. Right. And one of the things that I think is so important is that, is linking contemplation with our own life experiences. Mm. It's one of the things we contemplate about right. when we read the scripture. So how have I seen in my own life that this is true? Mm. Yes. How have I seen this idea that I just read about in scripture? How have I seen this played out right. in my own life? And to contemplate on that, really, God just really begins to expand Yes. That idea, and it helps us also to interpret the scripture. Life experiences help us to interpret the scripture. So contemplation yes. is really key. It is. And, you know, you, you made another point last week that I remembered as you were describing this. Every one of us, every one of you watching this, are more uh, 
contemplative than you think. Yeah. We all think we all contemplate on things all the time. Right. All we're saying is that for the benefit of our relationship with God to go deep, we need to be willing to contemplate what we hear, whether it's in song, what we read, what we hear from the pulpit on yeah. Sunday morning or in uh, Bible study groups, small groups, wherever it is that we are being led by the Holy Spirit to learn something new, when something strikes us, no matter how big or small we may think it is, it doesn't matter. When something strikes us, when, it's, right. when it sticks out, we need to grab a hold of that, and we need to contemplate that. Yeah, not leave it until right. God is done with it. Right. Sometimes we think, well, I've got to go to the next idea. I've got to do the next right. thing. Right. Um, you know, I need to go to the next thing that God wants to do. Right. Uh Hey, there, there's a word in scripture that really is connected to contemplation and that really speaks to the importance of, 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 of staying with that idea until God is done with it. Right. Dwelling. Ooh, yes. We need to dwell on that for a while that and is, not just rush through it. That's a really good word. And yeah. it's not used very often today. Yeah. So that's a really good word. Well, so I, I, I think if we, you and I could continue to talk about this for the rest of our time, but we're going to run out of it. So we should probably talk about this week, which is meditation. Yeah. You, you alluded to it just a moment ago. And so the, the other thing I want, I want to say it again before we move on, we have to remember that the, these guys developed a mindset and a heart set towards God. And the other thing that you pointed out last week was James's admonition not to be double-minded. Yeah. Right. So if we're single minded, if we if we have a singular focus to grow in Christ and to be receptive and sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit, that is a mindset that develops a heart set. And they, they just walk together. So but let's talk about meditation today, okay. because I, I think it's the next because uh, it's the obverse of that coin. Right. Yeah. So uh, and it was really funny. You, you called me out last week. I didn't have my book. <laughs> I miss a day. Well, well, we both have it today. <laughs> we both have it today. And, and I went to her section on meditation, and yeah. I've got to share this with you. Just right out of the gate, the very first two sentences. You ready for this? Meditation is not simply a discipline of Eastern religions and New Age gurus. Meditation rests at the core of Judeo-Christian spirituality. It's an invitation to apprehend, apprehend God. God. Apprehend God. That's amazing. Yeah, that's powerful. And, that's powerful. Yeah, you know, and I've got to tell I got to tell a quick story here because I know that there's someone who's hearing the word meditation and they're already yeah. starting to freak out a little that's bit. That's right. That's exactly right. Uh, so let's talk about that. What we're talking about here is not in line with Eastern discipline, right, uh, or New Age idea of meditation, which is the emptying of one's mind. Yes. To become just a blank tablet, that is not what we're talking about here. And for, frankly, that's not what the Bible is talking about here. Yeah, the goal, and, and I'm glad you brought that up, the goal of Eastern meditation is the emptying of your mind. Right. Okay? Nirvana, I think they refer to that. Right. Or, uh, you know, reaching a state of nothingness. A Zen state of nothingness. Yeah, right. so, yeah. you know, that is the exact opposite right. of what Christian meditation is right. all about. Yes. It's not about emptying your mind. It's about filling your yes. mind with God mm. and with his word. Absolutely. And so, I, you know, it's so interesting. I had a member of my staff years ago who wrote a really good article about the role of Christian med uh, meditation in his own journey. Mm. And he received a lot of negative criticism from people wow. that was saying that, you know, that he was bringing new age ideas into the church and stuff like that. Right. Nothing could be further from the truth. Right. You know, I'm just, I'm just thinking about what it says in jo Joshua 1, 8. Mm. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. Right. So that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Yes. Then you will be prosperous and successful. That's Joshua 1.8. Mm -hmm. So the, the whole idea of Christian meditation, okay, is, is obedience. 
Right. It's it's actually being obedient to the word that you are meditating upon. Right. And that's going to result in obedience. And it's it's filling your mind and filling your heart with the things that God has said. Yes. That's the purpose of Christian meditation. Mm. That's good. No, <laughs> you know, I just noticed what, what Peterson wrote there right below that from Psalm 66, 63, 6. If I'm sleepless at midnight, I spend the hours in grateful reflection, reflection, meditation on God's word. Yeah. Not not on the, the vast emptiness of space, but on what God has for us. And how, you know, how often do we find ourselves meditating or thinking about for a long period of time the wrong things? Yeah. You know, the, the worries of the world, you know, the, uh, we, we pointed that out with uh, Antonius last week about, you know, he, he, the second verse that caught his attention was not to be anxious about anything. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, if we focus our hearts and minds on contemplating God's word and then meditating upon that word as well, we're not going to have room. It's a remedy. Yes. It's a remedy for anxiety. That's and I think in this day, mm. um, you know, during all this, uh, the coronavirus mm -hmm. and and everything that's occurred in our world. Right. It's been my observation, and maybe it's been your observation too. Mm -hmm. Anxiety levels with people. Oh, they're through the roof. Are at an all time high. I mean, yeah. I remember in my own life how anxieties uh, elevated. You know, during um, nine eleven, for instance. Oh yeah. I mean, everybody was anxious, but right. you know, that lasted for a season. Mm -hmm maybe for a week. Right. And then um, you saw anxiety levels start to go down right. as, you know, as life became more and more normal, I guess you could yeah, say. absolutely. Um, as things kind of leveled <laughs> out. Right. But look, this thing started in March. Man. Right. It, it's just been relentless. I, and, and I'm yeah. hearing stories as a pastor mm -hmm. um, about friends of mine that are becoming so anxious right. about everything. And so if ever there was a time mm. that our folks needed to learn yes. the spiritual discipline of meditation, right. it's now. Wow. You know, learning how to meditate upon the things of God as a discipline. Yes. You know, that's <laughs> so let's talk about tools real quick. Okay. So, I mean, we, we've got more to say here, but it's like this. I, I looked at my bookshelf. I was looking for preparing for this, right? right? And and I looked and I found this devotional that I have two of, by the way. Uh, this day with the master, 365 daily meditations. Yeah. The whole, the whole purpose of this devotional is with the preference of a daily meditation is to go to the day to read what, the author has put here and then to think about that and meditate on that yeah. meditate on God's word and the context and while you're meditating you know and you're meditating on the context suddenly you go oh that's what you want me to look at meaning the Holy Spirit right. saying hey did you catch that bud right you know did you catch that Robert and you go oh that so this is this type of tool, and by the way, I want you to have this. What? Yeah, I want you to have that. And uh, this is This Day with the Master, 365 Daily Meditations. Right. This is by Dennis Kinlaw. Man, he was a Wesleyan <laughs> holiness giant. And I don't have this in my library, so, so well, thank you very much. Well, praise the Lord. You're very welcome. The, because he and I use these as tools not only for our own personal devotional life and walk, but, you know, we teach from these sort of tools. You can learn from these sort of tools. You know, he, he's, he is the expert at, you know, secondhand bookstores. Uh -huh. Find a secondhand bookstore, buy tools that speak to you. Speaking of tools, I, I mentioned this earlier to Pastor Bud, and I want to mention it to you now. We're covering these disciplines. And the truth is, is that none of us can do every single one of these every single day. That is correct. The truth is, is that it's our heart's intention to do what the Holy Spirit is leading us to each day. What is speaking to us? Uh, I've had devotionals that I have followed for three months and then set them down because the Holy Spirit directed me to something else that was more timely to the season of life that I was in. Uh, the truth is, is that you, the Holy Spirit will guide us 
to the disciplines that are going to be the most effective in helping us grow in grace. You know, and it's really okay to say this. Uh, there are some disciplines that are more helpful to me right. than others. Yes. I mean, it, it's really okay to say that mm -hmm. um, because our temperaments are all different. Right. We're at different places in our spiritual pilgrimage. Right. Um, there are a variety of things that contribute to the fact that there are some disciplines that are more effective than others. I remember once I went to a retreat mm -hmm. uh, and it was it was called a silence retreat. Oh, okay. Okay. And I think probably in, as time goes on, we'll see that there is a, a definite connection uh, between meditation and silence. Okay. Uh, sometimes our best meditation is that when we've cut out all ambient noise. Right. Um, when we've cut out all, we, we've turned the volume way down. Mm-hmm so that we can hear the voice of God, silence. So I went to the silence retreat and I had four or five colleagues that were on this retreat with me and they came back saying, oh, that was great, that was wonderful. How did you like it, bud? You know, it was okay. I mean, right. I, it, you know, I, it, it, it didn't necessarily ring my bell. That's not right. a good way of saying it. Right. It, it wasn't effective. I mean, it was right. helpful, but it wasn't nearly as effective for me as it was for my colleagues. Right. And my, I went away from that going, well, man, what's wrong with me? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, well, there's a lot that's wrong with me, <laughs> but that's not necessarily one of them. Right. You know, I think it's an extremely important that you find the di di the disciplines that mm -hmm. best fit into your life. Yes. That best fit into your rhythms, mm -hmm. that best fit into your disposition. Right. And, and, and those are the things that you want to get a hold of and build into your life on a regular basis. Yeah. And you made, a, you made a really good point there about the, the for me, maybe not for anybody else, but for me, the really good point about meditation is quiet, external quiet, yeah. right? Uh, I find it very beneficial when I wake up at, you know, 4.30 in the morning to go upstairs to my, my upstairs spare bedroom where my office is, I have a chair that sits by my desk and I can sit in that chair. That's that's my chair with God. Wow, that's interesting. And I and I sit there in my chair and I say, "Okay, Lord, you've got me up. Uh, this is what I'm thinking, and now I want to be quiet and just I want you to tell me what I need to be thinking about." And without fail, a passage of scripture or a psalm comes into my mind that helps me enter into a time of worship and meditation upon what he wants me thinking about. Mm. Not my day ahead, yeah. not, not, not the laundry list of things that I have to accomplish today, but in that moment, the things that he wants to tell me to draw me into a time, a special time with him. I went through a season mm -hmm. not all that long ago where I was waking up every morning at 3 a.m. Wow. I'd just be wide awake at three. Yeah. And I would talk to my friends about it. Mm -hmm. And some said, well, you know, that's the devil's hour. Okay. So that's the devil waking you up. Wow. And he is, is trying to do you harm. Mm -hmm. And of course, that, that really wasn't much of an encouragement. <laughs> right. Not you know, at all. The devil's hour. Although th there was so there's something about that because I had thoughts that were coming into my head mm -hmm. that were not healthy. Right. And that kind of thing. Right. But then I had another friend that said, well, you know what this might be? God waking you up because he wants to say something to you. Right. He wants you to pray. Mm -hmm. I thought to myself. That's awesome. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. And sure yeah. enough, mm -hmm. the next time I woke up at three o'clock in the morning, I prayed the prayer of, of Samuel. Oh, you know, speak Lord. Yeah. You've got my attention. Yeah. I'm wide awake. Yep. There's no sleeping for me. Your servant is listening. Is there yes. it is speak Lord for your servant is listening. <laughs> yeah. And I began to view that in a positive way that God was waking me up because he mm -hmm. had something he wanted to say to me. Right. And you know, the amazing thing is I would wait, I would listen. Mm -hmm. God inevitably said something, spoke something into my spirit that I needed to hear. Right. I fall right back to sleep. <laughs> That's perfect. I mean, 
You know, so I'm saying to you, being attentive Mm -hmm. to what God is doing in your life and some things that you view as being negative, uh, maybe God can use those as a way uh, uh, of speaking to you. Yes. And changing the trajectory of your life and the shape of your heart. Yes. How incredibly important it is in perspective. We talked about this before you and I have. How we view things is yeah. often the very starting point. That we, it's like the runner, the sprinter getting into the, into the blocks, right? If he doesn't get the blocks right, he's not going to start right. Maybe mm-hmm. these things are about that. You know, when you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, maybe it's simply as going, okay, Lord, I'm awake. Is there something you need or do I go back to sleep? Well, you know what that was, that shift from this is the devil's hour at 3 o'clock and he wishes to do you harm. Right. And that shift to, you know, maybe this is God waking me up Yes. because he's got something he wants to say to me. It's incredibly important. That was a shift of perspective. Yes. And oftentimes the role of prayer is gaining perspective on something. Oh, you know, we, we, you know, you go into prayer and you're praying a certain way about a particular situation. Right. And as you're praying, God gives you a new perspective on that. Well, that may be in the devil meaning to do you harm. Right. Or it may be God. Right. Really trying to say something to you and do something important in you. Right. And that shift to perspective. Doing a new work. I remember I saw a bumper sticker once mm-hmm. that kind of summed it up for me. Perspective is everything. It is. I agree with that. Perspective is Absolutely. everything. Yeah. It, de- it depends on your perspective. And I think we need to be realistic. Right. Uh, you know, I don't think we... Uh, can just constantly be looking for pie in the sky by and by. Right. And there are some things that we have the correct view of what's going on. Right. Yeah. But oftentimes we have a view that's going on that's 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 not complete. It's not full. Mm-hmm. There are aspects to a particular thing that we're praying about that we've not learned yet. And right. as time goes on, God changes that perspective right. and that changes everything. Yes. I, I agree with that 100%. And I know this. I, anybody who knows me knows that I'm a, I'm a glass three-quarters full kind of guy. Right. But that is my, that is my, that's my fundamental outlook. Yeah. Things happen that go wrong, and I go, okay. But I think because of this perspective of being three-quarters full, I adapt to those bad situations more quickly. I'm, I'm more more readily looking for, okay, God, what do I need to learn from that so that I can grow? Yes. And that, you know, instead of going, uh, you know, and this isn't a condemnation on anybody, but instead of going, oh, man, woe is me, it's like, oh, what do I need to learn? That's who I am, and, and I don't know. God's blessed me with that, okay? So, again, I know that folks have a really hard time. You do. Life is tough, and it's, you mentioned it earlier. This season with the coronavirus has been extremely difficult and it has created a lot of anxiety for folks. It has. So, and th- people have lost jobs, they've lost family members, they've had loved ones go in the hospital for extended periods. There are all sorts of things that can consume us. And I think what we're saying here this morning is that God is providing yeah. us with tools and meditation is one of those tools. Well, I, I, I want to reflect on this just a little bit more mm-hmm. because I think you are by nature mm-hmm. an optimistic person. Mm-hmm. I really do. Your mm-hmm. knee jerk response when something happens mm-hmm. 75% of the time, since you're a three quarters full guy, yeah. <laughs> 75% of the time your response is, yeah, that really stinks, but you know, God is up to something, right? God wants me to learn something, right? There's something good here. Mm-hmm. You know, there's something good going on. Right. God is at work in the world. Yes. And I think that kind of comes naturally for you. Mm-hmm. I also want to recognize that there are people mm-hmm. who are by nature right. one quarter glass yes, filled there are. people. By yeah. nature, right? they tend to be more pessimistic. Right. By nature, their knee-jerk response to something mm-hmm. is oftentimes negative. Right. And if we're not careful, mm-hmm. you know, we, we, we come to the conclusions about such people. Right. They don't have enough faith. 
right? Uh, they're not really, they're not really looking hard enough. They're not, they're not looking for the silver lining behind the cloud. And I think we've got to be careful there. Yeah, because I don't think that's the truth. And I, and I, don't, I don't think the, I, I, I think you, you've hit on something. The, they, they, their, their glasses aren't as full, but that doesn't mean that they don't have faith. It doesn't mean that they don't trust God. Yes. It doesn't mean that they aren't looking for the, the silver lining, if you will, or the, the thing that will get them through. That doesn't mean any of that. It just means that they're, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Their, their, their fundamental response isn't the same as mine. It doesn't mean that they don't have faith or any of those things. Uh, quite the opposite. I've, I've known some folks who uh, were very strong in their faith, and yet their tendency was the polar opposite of mine, right. you know, when things would go wrong. So yeah, I thank you for bringing that up and, and for bringing that clarity. You know, uh, that's important because at that point, I have a great deal of admiration for people who by nature are negative. Mm-hmm. And when they exercise the discipline of meditation, right, and when they spend time in Christian conference and talking with other Christian people, mm-hmm. and they start really drilling down on things, right, and then you see, as time goes on, it takes them longer, right, but as time goes on, you'll see their optimism meter right. begin to rise, mm-hmm. and they come to a different point, and God changes their perspective. Right, I have a great deal of admiration for such people. Absolutely. Because they're having to work harder. Yes, they are. And not only that, I I would say this. I suspect that their foundation tends to be a lot stronger. Yes, indeed. Because because of the work that goes into getting there. Yeah, their resolve is, Mm. is much tougher because they know. You know, do you think a negative person wants to be negative all the time? No. I don't. I don't think so. I think they know more than anyone else, you know, the, the, the negative effect that pessimism has. Right. And I, I think most of them uh, want to be different and live different. Right. And they drill down and they work harder right. and they meditate longer upon the things mm-hmm. of God. Show me your ways, O oh Lord. Yes. And when, when that person is able to move mm-hmm. toward optimism. Right. And hope, right? I have a great deal of admiration yeah. for such people. Absolutely, I, you know, I, I agree with you, and and I am thankful that that we've taken the time to flesh this out a little yeah. bit because yeah. I think everybody is somewhere in between. Probably, you know, I mean, the, I think the majority of people are really half full. Yes, you know, the the vast majority. So, you know, I, why God chose to make me and wire me the way He did, I don't know. I'm thankful for well, it. That's because the world and, needs optimistic and, people. Well, and, and I'm hopeful that, you know, I'm able to encourage people, especially those who are the, you know, the quarter full, not because I never, this is the other thing I, I try to be very conscious of. I don't want to be dismissive of, you know, uh, the, the way that they see things. Let me take this idea just one step further. We need people who are wired like that too. Yes. Because it causes us to go deeper into things. Right. And it also creates within us, you know, a, a sensitivity right. to others. It, it provides that, caution, right? Sometimes. You know, I mean, it's the, uh, you know, or the, the maybe not caution all the time, but the, it causes a pause. You know, especially, you know, if you're, if you're someone who is always ready to just go, Sometimes you need somebody to come, yeah, I don't know if that's such a good idea. You know, I tend to be an optimistic person, and I sometimes, when I'll present an idea in ministry, mm-hmm. you know, I'm just all pessimist, uh, uh, optimistic about it. Right. I have a friend who is just, who I work very closely with for a lot of years, much more cautious about things. Right. And so he and I had an understanding when I come with an idea that I'm all optimistic about, and this is the answer, and this is a silver bullet that's going to fix everything, right? His response was often, well, "Let's let's let's talk about the potential potholes here," right? And he was able to point out some things to me yeah. that I would have missed if he were not a part of my life, and that's invaluable. Oh my, it's invaluable. So you know what else we're talking about here? We're talking about the body of Christ. It takes all of us Hmm. working together. Yeah. 
you know, being mindful of your, uh, I'll just say in, the, in this case, being mindful of your hesitancy mm -hmm. in light of my let's go and us coming together and talking through that. Right? Well, I think one of the most yeah. brilliant ideas that the Apostle Paul, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, presented mm -hmm. to the church. Right. Is that the church is the body yes. of Christ. Yes. That was such a powerful idea. Absolutely. And then as he begins to unpack it, he says, are we all a nose? Mm. Are we all a mouth? Right. Are we all ears? Right. Are we all eyes? Right. No. No, no, no. There is um, a great deal of diversity. We all bring different gifts. Mm. And so we need people in the church whose first knee-jerk response is, let's go charge that hill. Right. <laughs> and we also need people in the church who are saying, why don't we just take some time to think this through? Because right. I have some concerns. Right. I bet if we had a clearer plan going forward. Right. Jesus season said something really powerful when he said, before a man builds a house, doesn't he sit down and consider how he's going to build that house? Right. Before he, before a, a general or a soldier goes to war, mm -hmm. doesn't he sit down and consider how many men it's going to take? Right. Where where he should place those soldiers? Right. What what weapons he's going to use? So, you know, cautious people. Right. Optimistic people. Right. We need them both working together. Working together. Yes. In the spirit. To, 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 to arrive at the place where God wants us to be. Absolutely right. That's that'll awesome. preach. <laughs> I think we just did. <laughs> I think that's awesome. I want to share one more thing with you. We're, you know, we did it again. We're running out of time. What? That can't be. <laughs> Brother, we, <laughs> I'm not going to say how long we've been. People are already wanting to turn it So what are you reading no. here? This is Invitation to a Journey by one of your favorite authors. Robert Mulholland Jr. Yeah, Mulholland. Yeah. I don't agree with everything he right. theologically, but he said some important things about spiritual formation and right. spiritual direction. Right. Yeah. And, you know, good point here. Again, talking about the body of Christ, right? We need opposing views. Sure. We need folks who don't necessarily always line up with what we believe and where we're at because they help us to expand our experiences and our thoughts. Well, it's it's a time of testing too. Yes. You know, I think it's important when you hear somebody that presents something that's not quite orthodox. Um, right. It, what we, what that does is that helps us create um, a defense, mm. a way of explaining what it is we believe, and that's Ooh. extremely important. Oh, that's great. What is he? Uh oh, there's a. Pastor Kent did a paper on it. Apologetics. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Apologetics. Everybody, I know I did for the longest time. When I thought of apologetics, I thought, what are you apologizing for, man? And no. that's not it at all. It's apologetics defending. As, de as defense. Right, as a defense of what we believe and why we believe it. It's, a, it's incredibly important. It's good stuff. Well, what do you know and why do you know it and, and why do you believe it? And you know what? That'll have to wait for another time. What? We're out of time, brother. <laughs> I hate when that happens. We are out of time. Listen, this is this is what uh, he and I talked about. This this is what we hope that you will gain, that you will uh, garner from today. That you will realize that meditation is yet another tool that can be put in your quiver or another arrow, if you will, for your development and your walk with Christ. All of these disciplines, and we have more to come next week. We're, I'm, we're going to be talking about worship. I'm, I'm just going to sit here with Pastor Julie Harris, yeah, wow. and we're going to be talking about worship. Uh, and by the way, it's more than just singing. I cannot wait for you to hear our conversation about worship next week. She's got some really important things to say about she worship. She does. She does. And, and it's awesome, and you, you really need to tune in for this. All of these things that we're talking about, and we're going to be talking about these right through August, okay? These disciplines. And we... We're going to be looking at some other passages, but here's the point. We've spent eight weeks so far talking about one passage of Scripture, and we're talking about disciplines that we can develop in our life. And the truth is, you need to let the Holy Spirit guide you into what you need to be doing this week, this day. You need to be praying more as a discipline and then using biblical exploration as a part of that or biblical exploration and meditation or contemplation 
allow the Holy Spirit to guide you. Well, God is turning lights on for people. Absolutely. There's Maybe you've never heard a conversation right. about meditation. Right. Well, guess what? There's the possibility that God just turned on a light for you to see something. Right. Chew on that. <laughs> hey, you know something? <laughs> you know something? This would be a great benediction from Psalm 1914. Would awesome. it be okay if I close with this? Yes, please. All right. I'm going to read it through once, and then I want you to repeat after me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Would you pray this prayer with Amen. me? I'll give you a line, and then I want you to repeat it aloud. May the words of my mouth. May the words of my mouth. And the meditation of my heart. And the meditation of my heart. Be pleasing in your sight. Be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, my rock. O Lord, my rock. And my redeemer. And my redeemer. And that's our benediction. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. We pray that this will be of use to you, mm -hmm. that you will grow in grace. We pray that you will go today and do what God has for you to do. Go in the peace of God. Blessings to you. Bye for now.